In our first session, I was making two or three major points. One of them is this, that the book of Joshua is in two parts, representing the two phases of the conquest. I tried further to emphasize that it is important for our understanding and then our application of the lessons of Joshua to understand the difference between those two phases. The first phase was Joshua leading the united armies of Israel to break the back of all opposition on the part of the kings and the inhabitants of the land. In that first phase that is completed in chapter 11 with a summary in chapter 12, no tribe was allowed to hive off from the army and go and settle down anywhere. They took cities galore. But when it says they took them, it doesn't mean they took possession of them. They defeated the city, they executed its inhabitants and their kings, as many as didn't run off. Uh, but then they moved on. They did not attempt in the first phase to settle down anywhere. It is in the second half of the book that the tribes were then given permission to go to their inheritances. In fact, it was only then that the geographical dimensions of each her uh, uh, inheritance were laid out. Secondly, I made the point that the book of Joshua tells us, can be summed up in the phrase that what Moses couldn't do, that Joshua did. It is famous but, uh, for the story of Moses' own rebellion against God, recorded in the book of Numbers. Because of Moses' rebellion against God, Moses was not allowed to enter into the Promised Land, and certainly not to take the Israelites into that land. Now, I haven't time in the course of these uh, uh, talks to explain why God treated that rebellion so seriously on Moses' part. That is perhaps for another time. But what Moses couldn't do, that Joshua did. So now let us observe that in the first phase of the conquest, there were three major objectives. put before Joshua. Each one of them was commanded by Moses. Though Moses couldn't achieve it, Joshua did it. The first major objective mentioned by God to Joshua in chapter 1 and fulfilled in chapters 3 and 4 was to bring Israel across Jordan. And Jordan, if you please, in flood. Unless Israel could be got across Jordan, they never would inherit anything first major objective was to get Israel across the Jordan. That's chapters 1 to 4. The second major objective has to be noticed very carefully. It comes in Joshua and chapter 8. Verses 30 onwards. Then Joshua built an altar unto the Lord, the God of Israel, in Mount Ebal. 
as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded the children of Israel, as it is written in the book of the law of Moses, an altar of unhewn stones, upon which no man had lift up any iron, and they offered thereon burnt offerings unto the Lord, and sacrificed peace offerings. And he wrote thereupon the stones, a copy of the law of Moses, which he wrote in the presence of the children of Israel. And all Israel and their elders and officers and their judges stood on this side the ark and on that side before the priests, the Levites, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, as well the stranger as the homeborn, half of them in front of Mount Gorizim and half of them in front of Mount Ebal, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded, had commanded, uh, that they should uh, bless the people of Israel first of all. And afterward he read all the words of the law, the blessing and the curse, according to all that is written in the book of the law. There was not a word of all that Moses commanded, which Joshua uh, uh, read not before all the assembly of Israel, and the women, and the little ones, and the strangers that were conversant among them. Second major objective, what we may call the establishment of the law in Canaan. What others refer to as the renewal of the covenant in Canaan. Now these verses could get easily overlooked. So they come after the exciting story of the fall of Jericho, do you see? And that is exciting. And that leads people to sing, Joshua fit the battle of Jericho, Jericho, Jericho. I've never heard anybody singing that Joshua also plastered an altar uh, and wrote, wrote the law on it. But somebody will get to around it eventually, you see. But much more important than, this, uh, than the uh, destruction of Jericho was this the achievement of this objective. And it was an objective that we shall see that Moses had twice commanded in the book of Deuteronomy. What Moses couldn't do, Joshua did, of course. And the third objective was to put down all rule and authority. And in particular, thus to destroy the kings, both north and south. And the story of that is given us in chapter 9 onwards. The defeat of the southern confederacy of kings and their systematic uh, 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 destruction. And then secondly, the systematic destruction of the northern confederacy of kings. That comes to its triumphal conclusion in chapter 11 with the list given of the kings destroyed in chapter 12. Three major objectives. Let's go over them and notice on each occasion how it is explicitly said that in achieving these objectives, Joshua did what Moses commanded. First, the crossing of the Jordan. This is chapter 4 and verse 10. For the priests which bear the ark stood in the midst of Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to speak unto the people according to all that Moses commanded Joshua. And the people hasted and passed over. Verse 12, And the children of Reuben and the children of Gad and the half-tribe of Manasseh passed over armed before the children of Israel, as Moses spoke to them. Verse uh, 14, 
On that day the Lord magnified, glorified, exalted Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. Objective number one, achieved by Joshua as Moses commanded, but couldn't do himself. We've already read at length uh, from chapter 8, the second major objective, so that I don't need to read it again, to remind you of how many times in that incident describing the establishment of the law in Canaan, the renewal of the covenant on Mount Gerizim and Ebal, was done as Moses commanded. Look at the third objective, coming now to its climax in chapter 11, the destruction of the king. Verse 12 of chapter 11, And all the cities of those kings, and all the kings of them, did Joshua take, and he smote them with the edge of the sword, and utterly destroyed them, as Moses the servant of the Lord commanded. 15. As the Lord commanded Moses his servant, so did Moses command Joshua, and so did Joshua he left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. Chapter 20. For it was of the Lord to harden their hearts to come against Israel in battle, that he might utterly destroy them, that they might have no favour, but that he might destroy them, as the Lord commanded Moses. 23. So Joshua took the whole land according to all that the Lord spake unto Moses. And Joshua gave it for an inheritance unto Israel, according to their divisions by their tribes, and the land had rest from war. Three major objectives then. Getting Israel across the Jordan. That was some gigantic operation. Then the establishment of the law in Canaan. And what that evolved, we shall have to see on another occasion. And finally, the destruction of the kings, the putting down of all rule and authority in Canaan, and thus making it possible for the second phase in which Israel would go now, each individual tribe, and occupy the cities that uh, they were given. You will find in that second phase, of course, that when this or that tribe went to their part of the land, uh, given them as an inheritance, some of the locals had come back again, again the, those that had skedaddled when the fighting was on and ran off, in the absence of the army. And it was a long time, says the book of Joshua, before the land was subdued. It was a long, long time of war. Uh, the people that had skedaddled when their city was attacked, in the absence of the army, because it had gone on elsewhere, they came back again, of course. So individuals did have to fight to get into their inheritance from time to time. That's the second half. We are concerned now particularly with the first half. So what Moses couldn't do in the three major objectives, Joshua did. Let's pick up, too, on that emphasis that God, in this process, exalted, magnified, glorified Joshua. Look at 3.7, for instance. Chapter 3.7. Verse, chapter 3, verse 7, And the Lord said unto Joshua, This day will I begin to exalt you 
glorify you, magnify you in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Look at 4.14. On that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel, and they feared him as they feared Moses all the days of his life. The glorification of Joshua. And when you think again that his name is Jesus, then you will record, with deep affection of course, those times when our Lord drew near to Calvary and stood, maybe having come out of the upper room, on the verge of Gethsemane, and lifting up his eyes to heaven, he said, in view of the cross, Father, glorify me with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. A little earlier in the room, uh, upper room, when Judas had gone out, our Lord's reaction was to say, Now is the Son of Man glorified. And you see, this time I begin to glorify you, says God to Joshua, as the ark of the Lord of the whole earth went down into Jordan and came up the other side. The glorification of Joshua throughout this first phase in the battle, and pointing us onwards, of course, to what our blessed Lord has achieved in all these three mighty uh, uh, objectives, and is thus glorified in so doing. There were three major objectives there. There were three obstacles, notable obstacles. It wasn't merely a question of getting Israel across Jordan. That was bad enough. The numbers of Israel, of course, by the scholars disputed. And there are difficulties with knowing how to translate the term Elif and Elafim. But uh, that said, with a large number of peoples, getting them across Jordan. Well, in an ordinary army, that would be what the sapper's job would have to be, <laughs> to, say, to build a bridge or so. It wouldn't be enough to take the fords of Jordan. How would you get all those hosts across the fords of Jordan? Take forever. <laughs> but the fords wouldn't have been visible anyway because it wasn't a question of just crossing Jordan. It was crossing Jordan at the time of flood. And this was springtime when the snows on Mount Hermon and all the rest of it would now have melted and Jordan would be a very swift flowing stream at that time of year. And it, as you see, had overflowed its banks. The plain of Jordan was more than a wide, mile wide, you know. And then there was what is called the Pride of Jordan, a lot of these thickets, bushes of all kinds, low standing bushes all over the plain. And that would be bad enough to get yourself through. For now and again, you might come across a lion, even in those times, there were lions around occasionally. And some lion might hop out of these bushes at you. But to get through it with Jordan in the flood and the whole thing submerged in one whirl of thickets under the water so you couldn't see where the brink of the river was. This was a mighty great difficulty, natural difficulty. And to take a people across would be a danger of stampede, of course. And then the crowd getting out of control and stamping on each other and a lot of them drowning. Jordan in flood was the big obstacle to getting across 
into their promised land. And then when they got across, and they had to uh, uh, fulfill, achieve the next big objective. Uh, they are told by Moses in the book of Deuteronomy, when you've crossed the Jordan, in the day you cross Jordan, you shall build these, this altar at Mount Gerizim and Ebal. Well, very nice, Moses, that's easily said, old boy. Uh, you haven't been across to look yourself yet, have you? What, ho? Huh? How, how, how do you get the troops up there? Do you see? Because if you're going, uh, uh, when they got across, they encamped at Gilgal, fair enough. If you're going to take the troops up and the nation up to, to Mount Ebal and Gerizim in the Midlands, you've got to go northwest, north-northwest, you see. You've got to go up the mountains and over with Jericho armed to the teeth on your right flank followed by AI and other such disreputable places. <laughs> Some difficulty. Ha! Huh. If they were going to achieve the second big objective, to get to Mount Ebal and Gerizim and establish the law there, then the big obstacle, of course, was Jericho. Until Jericho was wiped out, no commander would dare to take his troops by Jericho, an attempt to reach Ebal and Gerizim. The second objective had its obstacle, and the obstacle was, of course, overcome, as we shall see. The third objective, putting down all rule and authority. No good trying individual Israelites uh, acquiring land there when there were big cities, walled cities, run by kings. And if the Southern Confederacy weren't much to look at, though some of them were, the Northern Confederacy certainly were, we would be wrong to think of them as virtual savages, you know, or primitive people from England in the Middle Ages, these, some of them, were highly specialised civil engineers. Anybody here that's been to Gibeon and the uh, pool at Gibeon, where Abner's chaps and David's chaps under Joab met and played war games at the pool at Gibeon. Well, anybody who's been there will know what that is. It is not a pool. It's a splendid work of uh, civil engineering, uh, do you see. If you had a city and it was built on a hill, which is a good place for a city to be, because the enemy couldn't drive his chariot up the hill, and it gave you an advantage if the enemy was coming up uh, uh, to pour whatever you liked on his head coming as you over, uh, were at the top, that was a distinct advantage to build a city on a hill. But then it had a disadvantage. You would need the water supply. And the water would normally be down in the valley. Yeah? So if an enemy came and you were in your city and you'd got walls around it and the enemy couldn't break it, but if you had no water, he starved you out, of course. And what they did was to build the city and its walls, but inside the city wall, they dug an enormous great hole through the rock that went right down with a winding staircase going round the inside of this mighty great hole, do you see? And then when they got to the bottom of the hole, there was an opening to a staircase. And this staircase tunneled down further down the rock, do you see? down and came out by the stream of water so that the women could go down with their pitchers and uh, pails, you see, and go down the steps on the inside of the big hole and then down through the narrow staircase 
down to the pool of water, fill their water jugs and pitchers and pails, and bring it back up, even though the enemy were around. And what they did when the enemy was coming, they would um, uh, hide the staircase so the enemy couldn't find it, do you see, where it was. There's that such a place, at the, the, the thing at Gibbon, and if you pay the little local boy that lives around the corner, he'll open the door for you and you'll see the, the, the uh, staircase going up on a beautiful cobbled roof. Oof. And those of you who have been to Megiddo will see an even greater wonder. That's also built up on a hill, and that has a, 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 a hole and then a, a gallery going for an enormous way out to the pool. You can walk along it to this day, of course. And the city of Hatzor had a similar one. These weren't savages, you see. Capable civil engineers, particularly the northerners were. No use. Israel thinking to plant little uh, uh, settlers like, like Puritan Americans in different places, fighting a few Indians. You had to put down all rule and authority. And we've read the verses, how Moses commanded it, and how under God, Joshua and the united armies of Israel did it. Three obstacles, therefore. Three miracles. Of course, there was a lot of fighting to be done. And uh, Joshua doesn't disguise it. We'll come to that in a minute, as to the tactics they used. But for all their fighting, they never would have succeeded unless God had intervened on each occasion with a notable miracle. The first one was in getting them across Jordan, that the waters were suddenly cut off. Some people will say it was because there was a landslide a few miles up the river. That may well have been the method God used. It has happened in more recent times which stopped the flow of water, do you see? If that is the method God used, though the text doesn't tell us that, uh, it still was a, 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 a miracle of divine inter intervention, but also a miracle of timing, that it should be done at the precise moment the water stopped when the priest's feet stood on the brink of Jordan in the water. Do you see? A miracle performed by the God of the whole earth. And of course the big miracle in the second objective. The obstacle was Jordan. Uh, all straightly uh, uh, shut up uh, against an attack. And how on the seventh day as the people shouted the walls fell down and Israel was able to get in. And the third objective, the putting down of all rule and authority, that was a hard slog of systematic warfare and yet a notable miracle. When the southern confederacy attacked Gibeon because Gibeon had made peace with Israel. Well, God sent Joshua uh, to save them, but God rained down stones from heaven. And more than, up, more than that, when mopping up became, a, a, a militarily speaking, a very important uh, necessity, Joshua stood and commanded the sun not to go down, commanded the moon to stand still. And according to the simplicity of the text, the sun stood still, stood still for a whole day and didn't go down, do you see? An outstanding miracle. 
in that third division. While we are at military matters, the objectives, the obstacles, the fighting that had to be done and then the divine miracles without which their fighting would have been in vain, we might care to notice, en passant, so to speak, uh, the various military tactics that are described in the book of Joshua. The book of Joshua is never dull, you know. There were many battles, and if he had recorded all of them, they would have been boringly monotonous. I'm sure they would have been. But it doesn't record every battle. But it does record some notable battles and the use of military tactics. And the stories that uh, uh, describe the battles at length, no two are alike. They all involve different military tactics. So if you're not a military man, and I'm not, you can go to sleep for the next uh, five minutes, and we shall be woken up when the cameras lose patience with us. But uh, do you see, mm -hmm. there was uh, the use of uh, reconnoitering. Joshua, we're told, sent spies across, even before they crossed Jordan. It was a very wise move. They're called spies in our texts. They were reconnoitering scouts. They weren't going across to see what kind of a land it was. Israel already knew that from the 12 spies that were sent in uh, uh, years before, when they first reached the borders of Canaan. These scouts were going across to see what the intentions of the local uh, people were. There was Jer Jericho, for instance, standing there. What was the king going to do? They'd seen the uh, forces and the Bush Telegraph would have told them the forces of Israel coming up the other side of Jordan. What would the king of Jericho do to take an army across the Jordan if the king was intending to come out and attack them? Would have been a very perilous thing to get at. And Joshua, being a sensible military commander, first of all took the precaution of sending a few scouts out, even before they attempted to cross the Jordan, to examine Jericho in particular and found that the king wasn't intending to come out, but had fortified the city and was going to impose siege conditions, seemingly confident that Israel would never be able to get inside their fortifications. And then, of course, there was the organizing of the crossing of Jordan what in ordinary military terms had not God had God not done a miracle would have been a job for the sappers to do. They didn't need sappers on that occasion. God did a miracle. Then there's the campaign against Jericho told at somewhat length. And the problem there, military speaking, is if a city is uh, in siege and has, has got uh, walls do you see, and barred gates, how do you get in after them? It wouldn't be safe to take an army by Jericho and up to Mount Ebal and Gerizim if um, the people inside hadn't been dealt with. For once the army had come, they could open the gates and come out after you. So the problem, military speaking, was how did you get in? Well, God gave the answer. The walls came down, miraculously. Well, then there was the next city. That was Ai. And the problem there was not how did you get in. The eventual problem was how did you get them out? <laughs> and the tactics are described. An ambush behind the city and the use of feigned retreat. It was a feint. When the men came out of the city, 
Joshua and his army uh, 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 made as if they had been defeated and they're panic-stricken, they started to run off. And the people of Ai came out after them, which is just what Joshua was hoping they would do. It was a question of how you get the people out. Yes? Makes interesting reading, doesn't it? I mean to say, all these differences, even from a military point of view, it's better than some of the TV programs, you see. I mean, at late night, uh, looking and imagining these things. They didn't, yes, do you see. Uh, then Gibeon. It was the city of Gibeon. And actually, the southern confederacy of kings didn't at that point come against Israel. They came against Gibeon and besieged it. The Gibeonites managed to get out a message to Joshua to come and help us. And the Lord intervened and told Joshua to go and get at it quickly. And now Joshua used the tactics of a forced march, like old Napoleon used to, so that he could take the enemy by surprise, never expecting them to turn up so soon. He did a forced march, and that was some march that was up the hills and over, up to Gibeon. And because it was a forced march and arrived early in the morning, when the besieging army didn't expect him, he attacked them and threw them into panic confusion, of course. And they fled. And then Joshua saw that it was not enough to overcome them, uh, and, and so they fled. Because as they fled, they would try to get back into their walled cities and be an endless nuisance. Therefore, now, military speaking, he must mop them up. You see, and you are treated to a long description of the mopping up operation. And because it was going to take so long, it was that for that reason that Joshua called for the sun to stand still, to give him daylight enough to get on with the job. Yes. And in addition to those things, we are told in simple phrases that when it came with the rest of the Southern Confederacy, and the Northern Confederacy. It was a matter of persevering, systematic warfare, going round the country, reducing city after city after city after city. There was a long, plodding work of systematic warfare to be done. This is the outlines of Joshua then, and the first half of the book, what um, Joshua, what Moses couldn't do, the three great objectives which Moses commanded but couldn't himself do, that Joshua did. And as I say, it was God's intention by those miracles to magnify, to glorify Joshua that people then should fear and obey him like they feared and obeyed Moses. You will remember what John says in his uh, record of our Lord's coming in the first chapter of John, as he contrasts John, our Lord, with John the Baptist, and our Lord is contrasted with Moses. For the law was given by Moses, Grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. Yes, God magnified Joshua. Now, for time's sake, I want to uh, 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 leave chapter one, which will come back to it. I want to leave chapter one and for a brief while discuss with you Rahab. Because when they got across uh, the uh, Jordan, uh, uh, oh, uh, sorry, uh, when uh, uh, Joshua was reconnoitering the place, do you see, he uh, sent out the scouts, and the scouts came into Jericho. And then they slipped into Rahab's house. 
because she was a harlot, you know, a prostitute. And there would have been many men coming and going and in slipping into her house, the spies wouldn't have been easily detected. What they found to their astonishment was that Rahab had been converted. And she had come to believe that the God of Israel was the true God. Uh, do you see? And had been converted. And so she hid the spies. I discuss her now because the book of Joshua will raise moral questions in our minds. Can this story be of God? What the systematic slaughter of city after city and their inhabitants, the women and the children, the little babes, some cities. How can you justify the claim that this was of God resembles too much the extreme, doesn't it? The strict extreme Islamic fighters blowing up innocent people galore in the name of God. How can you justify it all? Well, I want to begin to make some comments on it to try, try and take the view that Israel were a lot of savages and they came into Canaan to, and destroyed a civilization that they didn't understand, like the Vandals and the Goths who came to Rome and they were practically savages and came and destroyed the Roman culture that they didn't understand and didn't value. That, of course, won't do. The story here is, this, uh, this is inspired scripture, and it is God that sent them. So let's think. We must beware of exaggerating the problem. For after all, the judgment on the tribes in Canaan was a temporal judgment. This wasn't the end of the world. This wasn't the final judgment. What happened to the little babies and the innocent children in eternity? That's another story altogether. The fact that they perished in these wars doesn't mean they're consigned to the lake of fire for all eternity. Surely not. We mustn't therefore exaggerate the story. If, on the other hand, we think of the physical judgment and it was certainly severe, then it ought to remind us that according to our Christian gospel, there's going to be a final judgment. That will be infinitely more severe. It's no good pretending that that final judgment is not an integral part of our message that we have to preach to this world. It is good news, in fact. For in the Psalms, when the psalmist thinks of all the corruption of earth, then he calls on the hills to rejoice and the valleys to rejoice and the trees to rejoice and clap their hands. Why? Because the Lord comes. The Lord comes to judge the world. He will judge the world in righteousness. He will indeed, and Paul repeated it to the Stoic philosophers, that God has appointed the day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereas he hath given assurance to all men that he's raised him from the dead. It's glorious gospel that the corruption of this world isn't going on forever. 
God is going to put a stop to it one day. Isn't that gospel? Or would you rather have it go on forever? You should remember that this only applied to Canaan, not to the rest of the nations, because the Canaanites were, in certain respects, uh, very bad sinners. <coughs> Do you see? For instance, it is the accusation laid against them, see the book of Leviticus, that amongst other things, they sacrificed their little children to the god Moloch, hideous, sacrificing innocent babes to their man-made deities. Bad that, isn't it? Except, except, wait a minute. The last count I heard, there had been 40 million fetuses, human fetuses, destroyed in America? Were they human lives? Or not? If they're human lives, and up to 24 days, according to the professor of brain in Oxford, they can begin to sense after a few days in the womb. Well, if God took exception to the Canaanites offering infants to their gods, what will God say to our modern civilization that have murdered millions? Of fetuses, human fetuses. And then there were the sexual perversions, witness the book of Leviticus and elsewhere. And if sexual perversion has in our modern world been at the root of HIV, AIDS, and other such diseases, and it had the same effect in the ancient Canaanite world, what would you have got to do with it? Israel hadn't the medicines to deal with it, had they? I think God, as the great surgeon, took out his knife and just cut it out else it would have poisoned the bloodstream of generations. But that is the solemn side, God's judgment on Canaan, and we shall have to come back to it uh, later on. But now we're going to think about Rahab. <coughs> For before we come to any destruction of any city in this book of Joshua, you have the glorious story of God's mercy in the salvation of Rahab. It is put in chapter 2, even before the Israelites have crossed the Jordan, let alone attack Jericho. Rahab, harlot, and God's mercy to her. A woman converted from idols to serve the living and the true God. Destined to be the ancestress of Christ himself. I don't know if I had a woman like it in my immediate predecessors. I shouldn't advertise it to the world, would you? But our blessed Lord had Matthew advertise it. When he came into the world, these are my ancestors, and among them, Rahab. Let's just take a break and pause for that to sink in.
We shall come back to the story in our first session this afternoon. But I repeat the significance of chapter 2 of, of Joshua before the judgment begins is the story of God's mercy to Rahab and all her family. Will you not let us live, she says. And God's answer, yes, was certainly indeed. The story of her salvation and the wonderful incorporation into Israel until she became an ancestress of Christ. That puts God's judgment in its God-given context.